Hello, welcome to Naturopathic Beekeeping. I hope you can see me. Um, we're streaming live on Facebook and YouTube, and hopefully um, you can catch me on this. So just while we wait to get started, if you're interested in understanding more about different ways of keeping bees, that's what this talk is all about. I've been keeping bees naturally for a number of years now. And this is what I'm really passionate about. We've all heard that phrase that if the bees die, we've only got four more years of life. It's attributed to Albert Einstein, but there's some dispute about who actually said this. Now it's normally interpreted, interpreted that if the bees die, it means that we've got no bees to pollinate our food and that's why we will die because we'll have no food. And this is where science has gone down that great route of looking at robotic bees and various things that can pollinate our food instead of having bees, almost accepting the fact that the bees are gonna die. Now, I believe that the bees are almost the canaries for humans and what is killing them is killing us too. So it's not a case of we won't have the bees to pollinate our food after four years. It's just I believe that they're going to die out just before humans die out. So the, pea, the bees really are the key to saving the planet. So I'm going to be talking about how to sustainably keep bees without smoke, without sugar, without chemicals. And there's various ways of keeping bees. And a lot of these elements have become entrenched as, as part of a really important part of beekeeping. It's We're all familiar with the images of beekeepers with their smokers and just how familiar we get to that image. And also many of the public don't realize that bees are fed sugar, not their own honey. And also that a lot of chemicals are used within a hive. So this is the kind of thing that I'm gonna be discussing today. And it's important then that if you're working in this way, that your honey that comes from your hives is more natural, more pure and more healthy. And one of the problems we're getting is that there is this, um, this real problem of adulterated honey. So we may think that the honey is quite detached from how we practice with bees and how we care for the bees. But in actual fact, whatever the bees bring into the hive comes into the honey and therefore that's coming into us. So if we're going to eat the honey, we're also going to be affected by whatever it is that's affecting the bees. So we do want to have healthy bees, so then they will pollinate our food better. If they're healthy, they're gonna be strong and there'll be enough of them to pollinate our food. And again, we tend to think that honeybees are, are the, the be all and end all of pollinating our food. And you can see some apple blossom here with, with bees on it. But in actual fact, some of our native species, the solitary bees, they can be the ones that do the work of 250 honeybees. So it's really important that it's not just the honeybees, it's bees as a whole. So by caring for bees in a naturopathic way, we're actually helping all the solitary and the native species as well. So I'm going to start in a few minutes. I'm just waiting for some people to come on. And um, if you've got any questions, then you're in the right place because I'm going to be sharing help for you so if you're feeling overwhelmed with all the green issues lots of people feel they want to save the bees but they don't know quite how they're going to save the bees how what are the green issues what is the most important thing to do you want to do something but you're not sure what would make the biggest difference you don't quite know enough about what to do to help the bees some people think oh i'll get a hive and this is the problem is, is what do we do? How can we help? And sometimes having a hive is not the best thing to do. So you may want to get started or develop a more sustainable beekeeping practice. I have so many people that come and talk to me and say, oh, I really want to help the bees and I want to have some, some bees, but I've gone to a course or I've gone to a lecture and it just sounds horrible. It doesn't feel right. There's a lot of practices that people are not feeling comfortable with anymore. Some of the ones I've mentioned already, and then there's lots of other ones as well that those of you who've gone on courses will know what I'm talking about. So 
you may also be somebody who wants to transition from a more conventional method of beekeeping and now you're realizing that that method or those practices are not sustainable and therefore you want to change but do you change straight away or do we have to do it gradually so i'm going to be giving you some tips on how you can do that you may also feel that you're out of sync in your beekeeping group where you want to keep healthy bees, but you don't want to follow the crowd with the chemicals. And this was something that I started off feeling very strongly about. You may believe that the products from the hive are medicine, and you suspect that there's a way to work sustainably with the bees to share their product. Now I've got a little necklace here, which always reminds me about the bees and, and about the importance of honey. And this is what one bee will produce in its entire lifetime. It's a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So you could be interested in how the bees value the nutritional qualities in the honey so that you know what to plant and how to feed your bees. And you may also be interested to know about propolis and why it's so valuable to bees and how it could be key to human health, particularly at this time. So there's all kinds of things that you could be thinking about with beekeeping and thinking about with how you're going to be taking care of your, your bees or how you want to learn about beekeeping and what we can do to learn about this way. So, hello, I'm Paula Carnell and we've got a nice group of people here. I can see we've got Steve from Berlin. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a talk, but I'd like you to add your comments or insights or any questions in the comment box. So if you're on Facebook, you may need to add your name so then I can see who you are. And again, on YouTube. So just put the comments in and then at the end, I will do a question and answers session. So this is me, I'm Paula Carnell, and this is me with my, my B van. And this is how I work now. I actually um, travel around the world, working with all kinds of organizations, with individuals, beekeepers, honey producers. And I'm really on a mission to find out what it is that's actually affecting the bees and what's, what's helping the bees. And this is my bee team. So it's not all my bee team. I've got Kerry as well, who you'll see a bit later on. But together we work um, with our clients and we work in a naturopathic way. And one of the beekeepers, Joe, on the left there, he's been keeping bees for 40 years and he's written many books on treatment free beekeeping. So that means not using chemicals inside the hive. So we've all learned a lot from Joe and his wisdom and experience are what really helped to inspire me to to really find my own way and and decide on just how to explain the results that we're seeing and how we're helping to save the bees. So you may be asking what exactly is naturopathic beekeeping? You know, naturopathy, it's an odd word. It's not something that everybody is familiar with. And this is me catching a swarm in a basket that I'd, I'd made, a straw skep, skep basket. So you may also want to know what are the main principles? So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So here's a beautiful swarm. And the naturopathic perspective is all about the individual's immunity. So it's what we can do to protect ourselves and make ourselves best able to remain healthy no matter what is going on around us and in our environment. Now I'm studying to be a medical herbalist and one of the, the modules was naturopathy. And what I found amazing was it just seemed to tie in exactly with what I intuitively believed about health. I've always felt that the body wants to heal itself. It wants to be well. And we, we have sort of evolved into this whole system where there's, um, there's this belief that everything is out to get you. Everything's going to attack us. And yet we all know that if we cut our hands, we cut our skins, we don't have to do anything. It will actually heal itself. So our bodies are incredible things. And during my studies, I learned about um, Louis Pasteur and also Claude Bouchamp. And um, the French were in this battle about deciding about what was the, the germ theory. And conventional medicine has followed what Louis Pasteur has done. And over the years, I've been reading all kinds of things that have helped me to understand 
where our conventional medicine gone has gone and where the complementary medicine beliefs come from. And if you want to know more, I will talk about more of this in other talks about health. But basically, I come from a place where I believe that disease comes from within, but it can also be healed from within. And I'm an example of this. I've, I was very sick and I'm, I'm now well and I've used naturopathy methods to recover my health. So if you treat the immunity of the individual, or in this case with the bees, if we treat the immunity of the colony, then we can make them best prepared to remain healthy. So balance, both in the hive and in the environment. So balance is all about working alongside with nature. And this is what naturopathy is. It's about being in balance with na nature and all that is around you. And then you are supported, fully supported. Now, what I'm learning, particularly this year, is that nature changes. We all change. So there isn't a constant. So there isn't a one way fits all forever. Things change. The environment is changing quite dramatically. And also our internal environments change. If we're stressed, then we have a completely different body makeup than if we're very relaxed. So it's understanding the impact of balance and maintaining a steady system so that our bodies can remain healthy and heal themselves. And then propolis. Propolis is an amazing, amazing thing. So propolis is what bees collect from resins of trees. And it's the it's the sap that comes out of all sorts of trees. So propolis from wherever it is around the world can be different depending where it's being collected from. And then the bees take it back to the hive and they're alchemists. So by mixing with the enzymes from their gut, from honey, from wax, they will make this product that's very pliable when it's warm and they use it to seal up the hive. Now, what I really love about propolis was going to um, a natural beekeeping conference a couple of years ago. There were some incredible lectures um, from various scientists and various bee people where they were discussing and then as groups we were discussing the fact that we look at bees as individuals we compare them to humans. So we think because we are an individual, therefore the bee is an individual. And so we'll always see these wonderful stories of somebody who saved a single bee and they fed it a bit of honey and it's, or sugar, sugar water and it's flown off and they just feel, oh wow, I've saved a bee. But what perhaps they're not understanding is that that single bee cannot survive without the colony. Bees are a very incredible um, super organism. And so if a single bee is not the whole, but the colony is, then what's holding them together? What's their skin? What would we be if we didn't have skin? We'd just be organs and um, veins and um, bones all just jingling around, but we have the skin to hold us in together. And our skin protects us. It is a great protector. And it has all kinds of, you know, the natural oils that we produce in our body actually help protect us from viruses, from illnesses. And if you have a good, strong, healthy skin, you can remain very healthy. It will protect your internal organs. And so bees are the same, that they have a skin. But what is their skin? It's not what you see around an individual bee. It's actually their propolis. So when you see bees in the wild, they will coat their home, which could be inside a tree or it could be in a loft building, could be anywhere that, you know, they found an old disused bucket or um, or hole in the ground or a letterbox. And they will actually coat it with propolis. And that gives them an antibacterial, antiviral, antimicrobial, antiseptic protection. And this has been seen with um various, various reports and research projects where um, in Minnesota, they found that uh, a beehive, a bee colony had a mouse that had gone in there during the winter months to keep warm. And the bees didn't want the mice in their, the mouse in their hive, but the mouse wasn't going to go out through the little entrance. It has squished its way through. And the bees stung the mouse, but they couldn't get the body out. So what they did was they completely embalmed it with propolis. And that meant that none of the 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 waste material or the the degrading of this dead animal was going to affect the environment of the hive so that's how powerful propolis is and what they've also found now 
is that they can have colonies that are lined with propolis. And if they inject even some of the most dangerous and most contagious diseases that bees can suffer from these days, the bees still do not succumb to the disease if they have a healthy amount of propolis around their hive. So propolis really is key, not just for us to extract and make into tinctures, it's really important for the bees. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about propolis in a bit. So, and it's the natural selection. We need to allow bees to mate naturally. We need to allow them to find their own mate, to actually um, choose who they're going to breed with. A queen bee will go off to a drone congregation area to select the drones, and she will mate with between 15 and 48 male bees, male drones, to give her enough sperm that she will hold in her sperm theca so that she can fertilize the eggs as she lays them for the rest of her life. So she knows what she's doing each time she lays an egg and she knows which bee she's mating with. So the drones that get to mate with a the queen, they're the ones that, that can fly as high and as fast as the queen bee. So if we're in a laboratory or we've got test tubes, are we really going to be selecting the best drones that were best for the longevity of a colony of bees? So we just don't know. Natural selection, I think the bees do know what they're doing. So, and then we have hive types. So we know in the wild bees will be opportunists and ideally they would be in the holes of trees, but as trees that are just right are not so readily available as we fell all our forests or um, as the trees aren't being affected in the same way, you have this whole process, this whole interconnection with nature where you need woodpeckers to make a hole, you might need a branch to come away, you then need squirrels and bigger birds to nest in a tree to make a hole or a cavity that's big enough for the bees to live in and be able to remain there for a number of years. So this is all a process that takes a long time. And so man and humans have evolved various hive types so that we can take care of bees, we can give them a home. And I'm really interested in the different hive types and how that can affect the bees. So if you are a beekeeper and you're watching this, I'd really love to know. So just type bees in the comments if you are a beekeeper. And it's just always wonderful when we see swarms. And I love this image because it's got the heart shape. And I find almost every time I see a swarm, if you just get the right angle, you can have this heart shape. So there's something inherently loving about bees. And I just feel they're trying to give us messages. I just love the thought that bees are trying to inform us, to let us know that what is making them sick can be affecting us as well. So brilliant, brilliant. It's good to see some beekeepers here. And I know I've met beekeepers all around the world. So it's really nice to see um, beekeepers from around the world joining me today. But also we're, we're a great connection and I, we learn so much from each other. What we think we're in isolation or what's happening with our bees. And quite often we find that there's other things happening around the world that are similar or we can learn from them. Some places the bees are healthy and some places they aren't. And that's been very much part of my quest is trying to find out where the bees are healthy and what different people are doing to keep their bees healthy. So great to see some of you here. So if you're new, if you're a new beekeeper, so if bees have just swarmed into your garden, into your house, or if you perhaps bought a package of bees this year, um, I'd really like to know. So just type new in there. And it's really interesting to know how different people come to have bees. And I'm meeting more and more people now who just feel so drawn to be working with bees, to be handling bees and to be living with bees. So it seems quite a natural instinct to want to keep the bees. So this was me when I first kept bees. This was my first hive. And at the time I was mainly bed and wheelchair bound with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I had nagged my husband because I felt this calling to have bees. And the hive I wanted was a WBC because I was an artist, always a romantic. And this was the kind of hive that I loved. I had actually seen a hive that I've since learned was called a Stuarton hive, which is um, hexagonal in shape. 
And that was the one I really wanted, but I couldn't find them anywhere. And I didn't know what it was called and I just couldn't find images. So um, I went for the WBC hive and this is still a hive that I use regularly. I have, um, you know, for various clients, I recommend these hives because they have lots of uses. And what they're good for with our climate in the UK is they've got this double wall. So conventional beekeepers will, will say, oh, you don't want a WBC because it's a lot of hassle. It's heavy. You've got to lift the lifts off and it's all very difficult. But actually, I find not only does it add the give them extra insulation, but also if you're a new beekeeper, it's a lot less um, disturbing for the bees if you want to lift the lid off and just have a little peek inside especially if you put an extra lift on you've got the crown board over the main body of the bees and you can just tell from sneaking up the lid you can see how they are you can tell from the smells of the hive how the colony are doing and so this is a really good beginner's hive so I really like like these but if you're a new beginner um, a new beekeeper I'd love to know what kind of hive you've got and just write it in the comments. So because I was ill and I was keeping bees, but my main way of keeping bees was just having the hive in the garden and I had a mentor. And once a week I would pull myself out of bed and, and just try and pretend to be healthy and learn everything I could about bees. But I was also learning about my own health and I started studying the herbalism. And I also came across this quote by Linus Pauling, which was, you can trace every disease, every sickness and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. Now, this blew my mind because I didn't really know what minerals were. We all hear about vitamins and minerals in food. But this took me to understand more about the state of the soil on the planet, not just in Somerset, where I live, but on the planet and how we need the minerals in the soil to give our food the good nutrition. So there was a great um, uh, story, well, not a story, um, a slide I saw once in a, in a presentation, which showed a plate of salad. And it said, you know, this plate of salad in 1947 would have given you all the nutrition and, and minerals and vitamins that you would have needed. And it was a really healthy plate of salad. And then the question was, how many plates of salad would you need to have the same nutrition now, nowadays? And it was 48 plates of the same salad. So it looks the same, but because the soil is so deficient and in some parts of the world or most, you know, a lot of parts of the world, it's 75 percent deficient. But there are areas where it's 99 percent deficient. The soil has been so exploited with intensive farming that there is no nutrition left in it. And so that got me to thinking, well, if we're not getting it in our food, then how on earth can the bees be getting it in the nectar? Because if it's not in the soil, it's not coming up into the plants and the plants who feed from the nectar and the pollen, they can't be getting the nutritional benefits they need. And what I find really interesting now is the more that I read research projects about bees, there's a lot more information now about the effects of poor nutrition on bees and about the gut biome and this whole complex thing of the stomachs that we've not been aware of for so many years and now even conventional medicine is starting to acknowledge the importance of nutrition but with the subtle elements the the minerals and the vitamins and the the quality of those that is the key thing so the metallic minerals so the rocks in the soil and the the great big iron tablets that you can get they're not the same as having it in your food or actually having a plant-based mineral supplement so when I'm keeping bees, I like to have different types of hives because you learn so much from different hives. And this is a golden hive. And this is from the lovely Matt Somerville, who has a business called Bee Kind Hives. And he makes log hives and he makes um, freedom hives as well, which I also use. And this is a box hive, which I particularly like because it's working on the, the golden mean. So the shape that bees will will form in the wild. So if they're in the hollow of a tree, they're not actually in flat boxes. They're actually in quite deep crevices. And so bees like to make the wax comb quite long and, and deep. And we'll see a lot of top bar hives, which are often associated with natural beekeeping. So either a worry hive or the, the horizontal log hives and top bar hives which allow the bees to make their wax comb from a single strip of wood, from a top bar. 
Now, one of the problems with that for anybody who's kept bees in one of these hives is if you were to take some of the honey. And what happens all the time is you think, oh, I'll just lift this top bar. But the bees use their magical propolis, which is a fabulous glue that keeps everything in place and secures any nooks and crannies and crevices. And then what happens is the wood is just stuck. And so by the time you've sort of pushed and pulled and tugged and you lift it off, the wax remains in the hive. So it's not that practical. So what Matt has done is he designed this hive using the top bar principle, but instead of a top bar, you have a frame, but it's one big deep frame. So when you open it up, you can see the tops of all these frames. He also has a brilliant idea, which is one of those simple ideas that you think, why doesn't everybody do this? Instead of having plastic spacers or the Hoffman frames, um, he actually has nails that come out from the frames, both at the top and the bottom. So it keeps an even spacing between each frame. Genius, but absolutely fabulous. And then you have this Hessian cloth that goes over the top and you can see the stripes there. You can see those brown stripes and that's actually propolis. So if you look at that, what they've done is any of the draft that could be coming through the gaps in the frames, they've blocked it up with propolis. So they really are incredible. And this is something that I also find interesting with propolis is that quite often bees have been bred to not produce propolis because it makes the access to the hive so difficult for beekeepers. So this is another thing that um, you know I'm quite passionate about is by allowing bees to breed naturally, they adapt to their environment and therefore they can produce propolis if they need to. And this is one of the frames. So the bees will put the honey at the furthest point away from the entrance. So these hives have four entrances at the front, which we've noticed the bees will block up with propolis and open again. So this propolis is such a versatile product. So, you know, they can make screens with it and it means they can protect themselves from predators. Now, bees like to fly into the hive and go straight to the brood so that they're not wasting any time. So they can bring the pollen and the nectar and, you know, everything straight in to the brood ready to feed them. And the honey is less, um, you know, they don't need that speed. So they will go further away. But also they keep the honey further away from the entrances, as Joe has always informed us, because it's their treasure. And so it keeps it away from predators. So should a wasp who's perhaps trying to get into the hive to steal the, the nectar or the honey, um, they've actually got to go through quite a lot of corridors of angry bees before they get to the honey, before they get to the treasure. So it makes it easier for bees to protect their their treasure. And it is their treasure because the bees need the honey, not just to feed themselves and their larvae, they actually need it to build wax. So it takes eight kilos of honey to make one kilo of wax. Now in these frames, these are all natural comb. There's no um, printed or, or pressed foundation. This is all wild comb. So that takes a lot of honey which is one of the, um, the problems with natural beekeeping is that the bees need even more honey so that they can make their own comb. But wax comb holds all the pollutants that are coming because the wax comb is made from the honey, the quality of the honey is really important. So if they're making honey from plants that have been sprayed with various chemicals um, and insecticides or even treated seeds, then you'll have residues of those chemicals in the wax and in the honey because they've used that honey to make the wax. And there's actually been tests on wax and they found residues of chemicals that were banned 10 years previously, which raises all kinds of questions. Are these chemicals still being used? Are they still in the soil? Does it take that long for them to be processed through the soil and go through plants? or are people still using them illegally? So there's all kinds of questions and great life information that we can learn just from bees. So here's a sun hive and the sun hive is an amazing piece of kit. And this was designed by Gunther Mank. And again, it's based on the golden mean and he studied bees and bees traditionally have been kept in woven baskets in straw skeps. 
And straw skeps are really good, again, for the propolis because it's a rough interior that the bees can attach propolis to. So they can then make their, their home and coat it with a skin. So the sun hive, I was always very passionate about a sun hive and I, I made one and was really excited. Took nearly three, well, over three days. And um, it was a course run by the Natural Beekeeping Trust. And it actually consists of two baskets. You have an upper basket and a lower basket. And to comply with a lot of now legal requirements that you need to be able to inspect bees inside a hive, we have these curved wooden frames. So instead of the long frame that you saw in Matt's hives, this is more like a top bar, but it's actually curved. So the bees can attach wax to that curve and then it will hang down into the basket. Now, I've had swarms move into sun hives, but I've not managed to keep a swarm in there. I tend to find that after a week or two weeks, they move out again. And it could be because the early swarms are very large and perhaps they just feel that this hive isn't big enough. It could be because I haven't already got any wax there and it's just a bit too much work. But what I have started doing this year is thinking about the entrances and the entrance for a flow hive is actually underneath and it's um, a woven um, sort of willow or um, cane fan that the bees can crawl in, but it leaves quite a small entrance. And observing bees in our other hives, they do like to fly in and get next to the brood. Well, if they move into a sun hive, the brood is gonna be at the top. So what I've started doing now is making sun hives and making um, an entrance at the top, because I know that if I've got healthy bees, if they don't want that entrance, they'll seal it up with um, propolis. So I'm experimenting, but of course we have a short window um, and quite often when it's your time to be having bees moving in, you're busy with your existing colonies. So experimentation with hives can take many, many years. And so that's what I'm working on at the moment, but I still love the flow hive, um, the um, sun hive. And what you can do is you can coat it with a um, a dung, you can clume it so you mix clay with, with dung and actually coat the hive and that can give them extra insulation. And this shows you the inside of a skep hive. So this is a colony that we look after and this is all wild comb. So there's no frames in here. You can't remove honey, you can't really remove, remove the bees. Um, so it's quite a, a different method of keeping bees. But what we do is we keep bees in a variety of hives. Some we take honey from, some we don't. And hives like this will be a source of swarms. So because they're healthy, because they're not being manipulated, they're not being opened, they are likely to swarm and then we can catch the swarms. So I do love to have a mixture of hives. And it's just so beautiful, the patterns that they have. So the entrance of this hive is actually at the top of the picture. So we've turned up the, the skep. So you can see that they have these corridors that converge and then round the outside at the back, the furthest point away from the entrance, that's where the honey is stored. So any predator that's gonna go in through their entrance in that basket has got to go through those tight corridors that are filled with bees. Now, coming back to propolis, this is a hive and this shows you how healthy bees can actually block up a whole entrance. Now, if you buy um, beehives, you get these wooden blocks that you can stuff in the entrance so you can narrow or widen an entrance throughout the year. But what I find really interesting is, is these bees actually in a flow hive, and this was in South Africa, they, um, and I recently learned, this is Apis capensis, and I did read an article where they were saying that Apis capensis don't produce propolis. Well, they do, here they are making propolis. And you can see this is through the winter months in South Africa, which actually are, can be reasonably cold. And there's these tiny little holes, and that's what they would use for entrance. And then I've visited in the springtime when they're much busier, and then you can see they've just broken down or removed some of the propolis so that they've got a wider entrance. And this is a skep that's been clumed. And here you can see the propolis. So that's the dark brown that's actually on the, um, there we go. You can see that dark brown and that's propolis. So they filled in any little drafty gaps and that's an entrance. And this here is a block of shungite. And I've been using shungite for, uh, about two and a half years now with my colonies. And 
um, I, of course, I couldn't find a picture with bees on the shungite. And normally the shungite is inside the hive. But I put it on the entrance of this one so that the bees could find the entrance easily. It's sort of a marker, but also so we could observe them. Um, and what I find is that the bees will rest and crawl over shungite in hives. And shungite raises the whole question about the environment and about EMF um, pollution. So trying to understand the complexities of frequency and radiation and how that can be affecting bees or how it can even be affecting humans, it is very complex and it's quite difficult to simplify. But basically, a lot of the waves that we use for our communication, so for our telephones and our Wi-Fi, is actually a chaotic form of electricity. And in nature, we have a natural um, magnetic field. We have fields we all know of whales and salmon migrating across magnetic fields around the world. And bees are the same. And male bees, the drones, they actually have magnetite in their abdomens, which draws them like a magnet straight to the points where they need to go to mate with a queen. So there's all this intricacy about connection and about communication and between flowers and bees that's really, really important. And I've noticed and I've spoken to many beekeeper and people around the world. And there's a lot of people noticing that bees are becoming disorientated. And it's not uncommon now to find bees outside your hive just wandering around in circles, lost or bees. Even the whole colony collapse disorder was where bees were failing to return to hives. And now what's happening is bees are absconding. There's all kinds of unusual things happening. So the whole saving the bees is not just one thing. It's a complex issue. So shungite actually works by um, as a physical barrier for some um, frequencies or for some waves that could be difficult. But also it emits a natural wave. Um, so it's it's almost like a cleansing place it's all it's just how we feel better if we walk in the woodlands or if we walk barefoot in in lovely moist grass in the mornings and shungite is one of those properties so i will be talking in more detail on other talks about things like shungite and about frequencies and how the bees communicate with plants and how they communicate with each other and how important it is that we don't mess up that environment but does also raise the question of how does that environment mess us up if it is affecting the bees? And then here we have um, some wild bees in a tree. So it's always wonderful to come past a, um, a, a tree with bees in and you hear them buzzing and you can look up and you can just see them coming and going. So you know that that's a space that's coated in um, propolis. And then I have a bait hive in the middle there. So that's a bait hive for the deep golden hives. So I'll hang that up in a tree and a swarm will move straight in. And then when it's filled, so after about a month when the bees have just filled it up with wax and, and the queen has laid lots of eggs and they've all hatched, so you've got lots of bees in there, then I'll take the frames out and put them into a bigger hive. So it's a really good way of, of getting started with bees naturally. So you're using your natural stock instead of shipping in bees, which could be causing all kinds of problems. And then on the right, you can see the bottom of one of Matt Somerville's other hives, his Freedom Hive, which is made like a log hive. But I like it because it's got this thick insulation. So there's two layers and it's filled in with um, sawdust. But the bees have to make all their own wax comb for the whole um, for the whole of that shape. So it can take um, one colony could get about two thirds of the way through in the first year. And it's really important about when they move in and how they, you know, how the summer progresses, whether or not they can collect enough nectar to make enough honey, to make enough wax for the queen to lay enough eggs and then for them to make still more wax that they've got room for storing what they need to get them through the winter. So it's understanding the natural pattern of bees to understand how we can best help them. And looking at that freedom hive now, I say don't feed sugar and I don't feed sugar because I when I was first taught beekeeping, I was really quite horrified that we would take all the honey off and then replace it with sugar. And to recover my own personal health, I knew how toxic sugar was on my in my body. And I knew that it wasn't doing me any good and it 
it really is it's more addictive than some of the the harshest drugs so sugar is not good so why would we want to give sugar to wild creatures and I've stuck with this and I I don't believe in in feeding sugar to any kind of wild animals or even pets. And um, yet this year we had a swarm move into one of these freedom hives just last week. And I've noticed some interesting behavior through this year. So I've been thinking, well, how can we best support them? So maybe sometimes I may put some sugar, I'm, I'm considering that I will put a mixture, a herbal mix with the best of, of local plants and tinctures and actually give them some kind of food because I don't know where this swarms come from. So I can't give them um, honey from their mother hive because I'm not sure where they, they came from. So if they then have some food that will enable them to make enough comb that they can then spend the rest of the summer collecting nectar to fill in that comb, then they, it gives them a better chance of survival. But in an empty log hive or an empty tree hive, the chance of bees getting through the winter are really quite small because they won't have been able to make enough wax to store everything. So, and this is inside. So you can see in a couple of months, that's how much um, wax they can produce. So that's lovely, clean, fresh wax. And then we have a beautiful bee feeding on some some honey, which is what the bees need to be eating. So that's a lump of honey and wax that came off while I was doing an inspection. And so it's good to leave it near the hive. This is on top of a, um, a WBC hive. And so the bees cleaning it all up. And then again, talking about natural beekeeping, and we like to think of everything being natural. Well, I was in the Indian Ocean on Cocos Keeling Islands um, in January this year. And um, and I'd been hearing about these plastic hives and of course I don't like plastic and I'm uh, I'm really definitely against single use plastic. But I was learning, speaking to the manufacturer of these hives, Apime hives in Turkey, that they have found they need to use them in China because in some parts of, of the world, not just China, it's illegal to make things out of wood unless it's absolutely necessary. So if you're going to keep bees and you can't make a wooden hive, what do you do? And also with a plastic like this, it's actually sustainably produced and it's not a single use. That plastic hive will last forever. I mean, we know that plastic lasts forever, so there's no reason why that hive won't. And what I found to my astonishment in, um, in Cocos Keeling Islands was that these hives were absolutely perfect for the bees because it's a really humid environment there. It's about 28 degrees all year round and really moist. The air is so moist. So wooden boxes rot. And being a remote island, which only has a container ship every six weeks with deliveries, you know, for shipping, it's not very easy for them to replace things. And it's a collection of islands, which is full of um, coconut palms. And then the trees that they do have, which are, there are some magnificent trees with wild bees living in, but they're not the kind of trees you want to chop down because that it's just not sustainable. So by having hives, perhaps there is a place for this. And in these hives, the bees would actually create their own wild wax comb. So I'm very um, uh, passionate that the bees should be able to make their own wax comb because you, you don't want them to be laying eggs or using comb that's come from other bees or other sources, which is what happens if you're buying a wax comb, that it's lots of beekeepers have sent in their wax, it's all been melted down. And you can be getting pathogens or the toxins, you can be getting some of the chemicals in there actually in the wax and that's going to affect the brood and the honey. So an unhealthy bee, I mean, here's a bee with deformed wing virus and that's a good sign of unhealthy bees. So we really need to keep an eye on your bees. So it's no good just putting them in a box or in a, in a skep or a sun hive or in a tree and not keeping an eye on them. You need to be aware of what's affecting them. So stress can be affecting them. So moving beehives around, that's going to be stressful. Opening up hives can be very stressful. And then um, you really do have to be thinking about the fertility of the bees. So if the bees are not fertile, so if there can be something in the diet or in their environment that's affecting their fertility, then that could be creating disease. And maybe that's nature's way of culling a colony that is unhealthy. And then we can have autism. Now, I went to an incredible lecture uh, last year in Canada 
where Jean Robinson, who has been studying the behavior of bees in hives, was noticing that there were some bees that weren't actually interacting. Now, we all know that bees are social creatures and they work together as a whole. But by observing colonies, he found that there were there was now a pattern of bees that were not interacting at all. So they were just existing around the periphery of a hive. Now, he didn't call it autism, but if we see that behavior in humans, we would give it that label. But humans and bees are not genetically connected unless you go back 600 million years to flatworms. So how can we be exhibiting the same behaviors, but we're not genetically connected? So environment has to have an impact on what we're doing. And this is quite, um, quite revolutionary, really, to accept that our environment is going to affect our health and many of us have seen it over the last few months where mental health has been severely affected because of the environment of fear of disease that's spreading around the world of our um, the inability to have freedom to move around or to see people that you may need to see to keep yourself well and so people's behaviors and health have been severely affected there was a, a project um, a paper published in the british medical journal a few only a few weeks ago that was saying um, or raising concerns about the increase of death as a direct result of lockdown, not of the the um, COVID. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of things that are at play, and so disease is a result of all these things. It's dis ease. You're not at ease, and so the body's way of interpreting that is to break down. Is to is to think about what's important. So this is one of the reasons why I didn't like to use smoke because smoke just induces a stress response. The bees think their home is on fire. And so they go in, gorge with honey and, and, and flee. And that was what I was told was the reason for smoking. Because if you smoke a hive before you open it, the bees will go deep down and they'll, you'll see all the little bottoms sticking out of the, the honey cells as they're gorging themselves on honey. Well, I was thinking, gosh, if you're in a stress, if a human is in a stress response in fight or flight, your whole digestive system stops working. Now, if you're inducing stress in your bees every week, then how are they ever going to recover? And does that affect their digestive system? So could that be linked to nosema, which is the, um, the dysentery that bees get? So it's looking at the whole environment and the whole procedure of what could be making bees ill. So here is the beloved Varroa mite, which has caused a lot of problems for beekeeping all around the world. This little mite has spread around the world, supposedly transferred from Apis serrana, which is an Asian honeybee, and it feeds off the fat bodies in the larvae of bees. So this is a reason why swarming is really important so that the bees can have a break from the larvae. And so by suppressing swarming, sometimes you can be encouraging disease to stay. And I'm not gonna go into great depth about Varroa mite, but I will talk about pseudoscorpions because 50 years ago, pseudoscorpions were found in our beehives because they live in old straw and, um, sort of garden waste rotting material. And a pseudoscorpion is um, a, a kind of beetle, but it actually feeds on varroa mites. Now we started to worry about varroa in the eighties and nineties. And so screens came into hives. So instead of having a solid bottom of a beehive, you suddenly have a screen mesh. And the screen mesh was there so that when you put chemicals into the hive to kill the varroa mite, the varroa mite, the dead ones, would drop through, through the screen, and you could count them on a board, and then you'd know whether the chemical had worked, because you've got all these dead varroa mites, and also you would um, be able to count them. And so that was why we did it. But by removing that solid base, we removed the environment that these creatures can live in. So this is a pseudoscorpion that I saw outside a hive when we were splitting a colony in South Africa. And I thought then that pseudoscorpions would only live in South Africa. And there's been some projects where they've been breeding pseudoscorpions. But one of the issues is, and again, it's the way you think, is that the pseudoscorpions are cannibalistic. So the first um, response was, well, we'll breed pseudoscorpions and people can buy them in little packages and then you put them into your beehive and they'll just munch away at all the, all the varroa. But by the time your packages arrived, instead of having 
10 or 20 pseudoscorpions, you're just going to have one very large fat one. So they're not going to be able to breed. So this is the, the problem. But actually, I'm thinking from a naturopathic perspective, if we create the environment that pseudoscorpion scorpions can live in, so that can be in the straw from, from chicken runs, they, they still exist there in pig styes. So it's introducing the environment and then they will come. So that's something that I'm experimenting with. And now there's more and more research showing that the chemicals are just not working inside the hive. And um, and we need to stop doing that because it's doing more harm than good. If you don't kill all the varroa mite, you're then breeding resistant, you know, drug chemical resistant varroa mites who just become bigger and stronger. And I found by not treating, I don't have a varroa problem. I, I may see varroas early on in the spring, but what will happen is that the bees will just pull out any larvae that's been affected and you find that within a few weeks, the colony is absolutely fine. So I do know that when varroa mite first came out, it was a crisis situation and that many, many millions of bees were wiped out. But the bees have naturally evolved. And Tom Seeley's also done a lot of work on this. So there's lots and lots of arguments and scientific proof now that chemicals inside hives do not work. And this is another example. This is a colony that was abandoned for 35 years. And my bee team and I, we got involved because badger, a badger had attacked it. Obviously, there was so much honey in there where it had never been extracted. And the badger got hungry and decided to have a go at it. And these bees had no varroa at all. And they're living in an area where there's lots of other managed colonies nearby. So there was no reason why they shouldn't have varroa, but they're really healthy colonies. So, and then you have, um, when I traveled to Bhutan, I saw bees living in the walls of houses. Now this is Apis serrano, but my point is it's like living in, in tune with nature. They have the colony in the wall of the house. They don't take all the honey. They always want to keep the brood alive. So they'll just take the odd comb out every now and again. So they're living in harmony with nature and in a way that their bees are healthy because the whole environment there is healthy. It's sustainable farming. It's a simple life. There's no chemicals. And so the bees are healthy and the, and the people are healthy too. So this is a lovely picture on the left. You can see I've got, um, it's the base of one of uh, Matt Somerville's log hives or the um, freedom hives. And there you can see how the bees keep the base clean. So even though it doesn't have a mesh, it is actually a solid base, but they're keeping it clean. So didn't spot any um, pseudoscorpions in there, but we did spot drone bees cleaning, helping the, the female bees clean. So maybe drones are not just for two things, eating and procreating. And so what can we do to help? So it's all about education. It's about learning more about um, how we can look after the bees and how what we're doing to the bees is affecting them. If we sell less honey for higher prices, then the beekeepers won't be under pressure to put their bees under stress. There won't be this pressure to exploit the bees and take all the honey and replace it with sugar. We as consumers need to understand the value of honey, remembering that a single bee's lifetime will only produce this much honey. So it's really important that we, we see the true value of honey. And if you see a jar of honey and it's a couple of pounds, just like we've had the conversations about how can a t-shirt be two pounds, somebody is paying the cost of that somewhere down the line. And honey is medicine, it is a very special product and we need to value it. So it's having the confidence as beekeepers to know the true worth, to think about our bees and not be exploiting them by taking all the honey and selling it as cheap as we can. Also, if you use your local stock of queens and nukes, so either catching swarms by putting up your bait hives or having empty hives that the bees can move straight in, which I find happens quite a lot. Or if you are gonna, if you really are desperate to have um, a colony of bees, that you buy them from a local beekeeper um, so that you know that they're, they're strong, they're healthy, you know that they're used to the environment that you're living in. And you can buy packages of bees um, and I think a nuke is the nicest way because they've they've reared their own queen and they're ready to go. So it's thinking local. We all need to be thinking local and we need to stop using chemicals on plants and in our hives. 
I've already talked about inside the hives, but our gardens where we buy plants, there's chemicals everywhere and we need to start really standing up and refusing to buy things that are not bee friendly. And don't just presume because it has a bee friendly logo on it that it is bee friendly. It could have the logo because it's the kind of flower bees like, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't been treated with um, quite serious chemicals to make it pest resistant and to flower beautifully in your garden. And then we need to save all the weeds because the bees love the weeds. So it's keeping the dandelions, it's keeping the thistles, it's allowing them, they do their work because they're replenishing the minerals in the soil. So the clover, it's beautiful this year with clover. I'm just seeing so many meadows with clover and road verges and they just, they look so stunning. Just this carpet of white clover, absolutely wonderful. So, and it's remembering that the bees do know best. They know what they need to do. Those bees that had been left for 35 years, they were doing absolutely fine. They didn't need us until a badger had ripped the side away. And so we were able to, to put them into a, a nice new home and make them safe again. But if we listen to the bees and learn from the bees, as Steve, who's on this call, will know, it's so important. And we're learning, those of us who work closely with bees, we're learning from them all the time. Every year is different, every colony is different, and we need to be open to learning from them at this really important time for change. And then here's some bees that I give the mineral powder that I use. I take a mineral powder to ensure that I'm getting enough minerals. And what I do for my colonies is I also share some of the powder and they take it up. So if you're interested in that, then just send me a, um, a message or I can send the link. But there's a website, carnellsminerals.com, and that's where I can sell minerals to you if you want it for your bees or for your own health. So health begins from the inside. If Linus Pauling says that all diseases go back to a mineral deficiency, then the minerals really are important. And then I designed a tea towel. So this has all the plants that you need for bees and gives you a plant for each month of the year. So 12 plants so that then you're gonna have something feeding the bees all year round. But this is for the for Great Britain or, or the UK where I am. And then I mentioned my other BT member, Kerry. Well, here she is with me, she's in the white and we were, um, as most beekeepers find, you're doing lots of work when it's the hottest days of the year and you've got the most clothes on. So just to rest under the tree was just amazing. And this was after we'd been doing some work on the bees that had been attacked by the badger. So I love this picture because I think those of you who keep bees, you could relate to that, how you just, it's not quite safe to take the veil off, but you just need to relax. So I'm actually gonna be running a naturopathic beekeeping course. And I'll be doing that in, um, the autumn, so not long, I'm gonna start it in September. So if you're interested, then register for the course. And those of you who register because you're interested in the course will receive a free download of my ebook. And it's not too big, so you can read it, but it goes into a bit more detail from what I've talked about today. And it's called The Principles of Naturopathic Beekeeping. So if you go on there, enter your details, no obligation at all. Um, to do the course, but you will get information about the course as soon as it's released and you can download your book. So if you're interested in more natural methods of beekeeping, then you will find it there. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased that you've joined me today and you've stuck through my talk. So um, I've got books, I've got A to B's, Bees in Bhutan, and also my 40 flowers book, which I did before I kept bees but I used to paint flowers. So I have a collection of books and you can find it all on my website and you can find me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. So thank you very much. Thank you for those of you who've commented. So I've I've got a lovely collection of beekeepers here. So that's lovely. And I'm just gonna put on, there's the details for the courses. So if you're interested in that. Um, and if anybody's got any questions, then you're welcome to ask. I did get a private one, which was, um, let me just check that. Oh yeah, so it was catching swarms. I'm often asked about catching swarms and that's 
again, working with, with nature and working with the way that bees communicate. So what I do is I, I douse for areas, I observe where the bees like to swarm normally, and, um, and I will put bait hives up, but it's all about frequency and vibration. And um, so I will talk about that at another talk, but um, that's what I do. So any more information, just send me a message or you can read the book. So it's free for you today. So you just have to go to the courses.paulacarnell.com um, or send me a message if you're if you're stuck. And um, oh, how lovely. Kathleen has just said she had a bee land on her while she's watching this in the garden. So hello, bee. Uh, and um, I'm going to go and sit in the garden and watch my bees in the golden hive. So thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again. I think the next talk is a bit more about um, creating a buzz about health. So I'm going to be talking about the connection between bee health and human health. So I'm going to talk about some of the research projects that have um, talked about the effects that bees are suffering. So you'll learn more about how the bees are made ill by various conditions and environmental issues that are going on at the moment, and then perhaps where there could be parallels with humans. So thank you very much. For those of you interested in the minerals, it's um, carnellsminerals.com. I'll put the link in the comments and um, see you all again soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>